everybody. Hi, folks coming in. We're going to give everybody just a little bit more time to, to start coming into uh, to the webinar before we really um, kind of get going. So um, for all of those who are for who are filtering in right now, it's it's great to know you're there, even though we can't see you. So welcome to our program. Um, yeah, all right. So let's get into it, I'd say. Um, so welcome, everybody. Welcome to uh, the virtual Bill Ricca Public Library for tonight's program, um, Bee People and the Bugs They Love with author and beekeeper Frank Mortimer. Um, we're so glad also in this program to have folks um, also here joining us from the communities of Tewksbury, Chelmsford, Andover, and North Reading. So a great big welcome to everybody who is uh, hopping in from, from from our neighboring communities. Glad you're here. Uh, a couple of just very brief housekeeping notes before um, I, I further introduce our guest tonight. Um, so Frank, Frank is going to um, present for the majority of our time together, um, but then we are also going to make time for a Q&A at the end um, of his presentation. So for this Q&A, I just ask that you put all of your questions into the chat box and I will read them um, to Frank in the order in which I receive them. Um, additionally, if you're interested in Lizzie, it just froze. Frank, let's give Lizzie a few seconds here. Sure. Well, I'll just say um, thanks to everybody for, for joining us. And uh, it's better to have technical difficulties up front so everybody can get settled and then, uh, then we'll get started. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Haley Booksellers, um, nice independent local store that does have some signed copies of Bee People. And, um, you know, it's because of your local library as well as local booksellers that we're able to do programs like this. So please support local every time you can. And um, I'm very excited to be here. It's, uh, it's nice that uh, bee weather is finally coming around because uh, when, it's, when it's cold, the bees can't get out. So now that we're starting to see sun as opposed to rain, it's always a good thing. So Frank, I think Lizzie is going to uh, log off and come back on. Um, but uh, just for the sake of uh, moving, uh, keeping things moving, uh, wh why don't you uh, start with your presentation? Sure. And um, <clears throat> so yeah, so I'm Frank Mortimer. And uh, I, in addition to writing the book, I am an adjunct instructor at the Cornell University Master Beekeeping Program. I'm a certified master beekeeper, and I'm the vice president of the state of New Jersey's uh, State Beekeeping Association. I've been keeping bees um, for about 15 years. It's something that my whole family does together. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm excited to, to be in Massachusetts uh, tonight. I have several, actually multiple um, friends that are beekeepers up there and, uh, and always great conversations with them. So hopefully there's some beekeepers in the crowd tonight and uh, I do look forward to getting your questions. So please put them in the chat and we'll get started. So the, the, the first thing I always like to do is that if there's anything else that uh, you walk away from a presentation, there's two things to remember about bees. The first is that honeybees and yellow jackets are completely different animals. I always say it's like the domestic dog versus the hyena. And the best way to tell them apart is honeybees are fuzzy. They actually have hair all over their body. They even have tiny hairs growing out of their eyes. And then yellow jackets, like all wasps, are smooth or look like they're made of plastic. So if you remember fuzzy good and plastic bad, then you know which is the one that is mellow and is not going to hurt you. And then the other one, which is more likely to sting. The other thing to remember is that honeybees, their stingers are barbed like fish hooks. So they die when they sting. So that's why stinging is a last resort versus the yellow jacket, which their stinger is straight like a syringe. And so they can sting you multiple times and have no ill effects on themselves. The other thing to remember is that a third of all the food we eat is thanks to the honeybee. Um, apples, oranges, strawberries, all the good tasting stuff needs to be pollinated and it's pollinated by honeybees. And what I think is interesting to think about is that honeybees are not native to North America, that when the European colonists came over, they brought the bees. 
but all the foods that they pollinate and like on this slide were also brought over from Europe and are also not native to North America. So interesting to think that, uh, you know, how we talk about the apple tree or the cherry tree as being so part of Americana and both of those fruits are not from uh, this land. So how did I get into beekeeping? And this is why I'm really excited to be doing this talk because I got into it, I, I, like I always wanted to be a beekeeper. I wanted to be around bees. I never knew anybody that had them. I was never around other hives, but there was something inside of me that just wanted to do it. And so I went to a lecture at a local library. And so that's why I'm so happy to be doing this tonight. And um, it's, you know, Jersey, and I think has some similarities to Massachusetts. A lot of small towns, they all have their own personality. Uh, only in Jersey, they're all pushed together. And so I, I went to the next town over um, where they were talking about bees. And what was most interesting to me is that I learned that there's a local beekeeping club. And you know, here in the, New Jersey is the most densely populated state. And I actually live in the most densely populated county of that most densely populated state. So I was surprised in a, in a um, suburban setting that I'm in that there would be other people that would actually be in the bees and enough of them that could sustain a club that could meet monthly. And so I joined the club thanks to going to that initial um, lecture at the library and that's how I started. So I wanna just do a quick reading about, um, like even though that's how I got, learned about bees, I'm gonna read about when I first got my bees. Instead of being part of installing my first hive in my backyard, my official start to beekeeping came via a series of text messages from Sarah, my son's babysitter. Days before when I told Sarah that I was going to become a beekeeper and start keeping bees in the backyard, I got the look. Something I would see time and time again when I told someone about my hobby. The look is the facial expression that regardless of one's native language is understood to mean, are you effing kidding me? Sarah was overly dramatic about everything from breakfast foods to coordinating her outfits with my son's crayon selections. So the news of me getting bees really sent her over the edge. As I sat stuck on a train somewhere outside of Secaucus, the text from Sarah went something like this. There's a bright yellow car in the driveway and two strange men in the backyard. Oh, those must be the guys from the bee club bringing me my bees. Eek! Are all the windows closed? Can bees fly down the chimney? Ack! What should I do? Relax. You don't have to worry about anything. Nothing bad is going to happen. Now there's a huge cloud of smoke in the backyard. They're burning down the yard. No, they lit their smoker. You use smoke to keep bees calm. Hmm. What kind of smoke makes bees mellow? What are they burning? Probably pine needles. Oh, now they're carrying a box with a shiny silver top through the backyard. The fat guy's yelling at the old guy saying he's using too much smoke. The old guy is telling him to relax and he's puffing even more smoke at him. The old guy just pulled the screen off the box and he's puffing even more smoke. The fat guy's dancing around slapping himself. He's yelling about waiting till he wasn't standing in front of the hive. Now the fat guy is running through the backyard screaming, I'm hit, I'm hit, got my ear, got my ear. The old guy's laughing. Now they're both leaving the backyard. Someone's ringing the front doorbell. It's them. They told me to tell you that the beehive's in and they're leaving. I can see the stinger hanging from the fat guy's ear. Ew. At about the same time Sarah was hyperventilating on the living room floor, I received a single text. Bees are in your backyard. It was a piece of cake. Everything went smoothly. Good luck. At last, I had a hive in my backyard and it made me smile. It was something I wanted for so long and now I could finally call myself a beekeeper. So that was my initial start to it. And then eventually I was elected president to the bee club. And when I was, became the president, I had a lot of ideas for how I wanted to improve the club, including getting more members and also doing more events. But to do that, I needed people and I needed money for the treasurer. So the answer for how I did it was bee talks and living where there's so many towns, there was lots and lots of clubs and organization that wanted to hear about bees and presentations. And back to how I started by going to one of the library, it has motivated my entire bee career to give talks. And the benefit of that is that 
it was a great way to raise money for the club in addition to raising local awareness of the importance of honeybees and having local beekeepers. So the more talks I gave that I would get more requests to do even more talks and like it became like this cycle, do a talk and then get requests to do more. And what was interesting was that, you know, that every time I did a talk, I kept polishing how I explained things and, and, and the analogies that I used. And also if people ask questions that I didn't know the answers to, I had to go look it up. So then that way, um, the next time it was asked, I would be ready. So the end result of all this is that my bee knowledge really increased. And because I was practicing, like I literally have done over 150 talks that those explanations really became the foundation for my book because that's how I explain things. And then there's an old beekeeping joke, which is actually the truth is that if you ask three beekeepers a question, you're gonna get four answers. And that's because there's so many different ways to do beekeeping. And so all these differing opinions on what to do, a lot of times was leading to bad advice. So when, when I would be at the meetings and leading discussion, it became more of opinion versus opinion as opposed to opinion versus fact. And so I realized the next step I needed to take was somehow to prove that I knew what I was talking about. And that's why uh, I decided to um, join in the Cornell Master Beekeeping Program. And I can tell you the exact day that I signed up because it was February 8th, 2017. And the reason I know I signed up for the program on that is that's also the day that my daughter was born. And there's another beekeeping joke that's also true. And it says, I don't always talk about bees. Sometimes I'm asleep. And so, you know, my wife is in um, early labor. We're in the delivery room in the hospital. And I'm like, hey, you know, uh, that uh, Cornell program that opens up today. And uh, thankfully, because of the euphoria of early pregnancy, she's like, oh, well, you should sign up. So I literally signed up for the program in the delivery room, in the hospital, the morning that my daughter was, <laughs> was born. And now... Uh, some of you out there might be asking, well, what is a master beekeeper? What does that mean to be that? So I'm going to let you in on, on the secret. You know, we're not supposed to tell, but I'm going to tell you what the secret of being a master beekeeper is. It's being able to drink your coffee through your bee valve. Seriously, the Cornell program has four courses that take over 15 months to do. And at the end of each course, there's a final project you have to do. And then the, 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 of the first course I took, the final project was, hey, write an outline for a speech of talking about bees to non-beekeepers. And I was like, holy cow, I've, I've done this 100 plus times. So it became super easy to me. And thanks to the feedback that I got from my instructor at Cornell, um, it really was a changing point in my life because it gave me the confidence that I knew what I was talking about and it was received well by an authority. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna take that outline and turn it into uh, an article. And so the, um, the, the number one bee magazine for beekeepers, and for those that aren't beekeepers, yes, beekeepers do have their own magazine <laughs> and it's called Bee Culture. So I sent in my article and then the editor wrote back and said, oh, there's a lot of good information in here and he published it. And I was so excited that I wrote two more articles and he published them as well. So I went from never submitting any of my writing for publication to getting three articles published in less than a year. And the, that led me to continue to write. And what I really liked the most is that the more I wrote these stories, the more I was getting feedback of how much people liked them um, because they were funny, entertaining, and also informative. And because of that positive feedback is why I decided to write my biggest and best story, which is Be People and the Bugs They Love. So just what a few people <clears throat> who've read the book are saying, Harlan Coben, um, who his new book, uh, Will, is out, um, which has uh, reached the number one on New York Times. And he said, and, and what I love about this quote is that he has so many dad jokes and bee puns in it. It makes me laugh every time. But he says, uh, bee people is the bee's knees and getting a ton of buzz. Be smart, people, and read this unbelievable, interesting book and look at a quirky world of beekeeping. The New York Times said it was an achievement to convey so much knowledge so accessibly without being overbearing. And that goes back to the B talks that I did. 
and how I intersperse useful facts with my passion and uh, the funny book that's sure to swell the ranks of the world's beekeepers. The San Francisco Book Review, the reviewer said it, this ranks as among the best written books he's ever reviewed. And uh, it has great humor, use of al al allegory that reveals tremendous background knowledge and that bee people are weird and a fascinating lot and that how I uh, dive into them. And what, what's interesting too about that is I, as I've talked to beekeepers across the country and actually across the globe, the one thing that um, people always say is how there's so many unique characters uh, in their beekeeping clubs as well. And so I've heard from people like again, across, you know, in um, on the West Coast that have said um, that the people that they read about in my book reminded them of beekeepers in their clubs as well. And, uh, you know, but the big thing is, you know, well, what makes your book so special? And the thing that I like to say is it's not a how-to book. This is not like, okay, I, I want to become a beekeeper, so you should pick this up and learn what to do. This is more of a laugh at all the mistakes that I made book. And um, like I have a whole chapter called Bee Mistakes, and I'm going to read one of my favorite <clears throat> stories from that. Most of my monumental mistakes usually began with me saying, let me just do this real fast. Whenever I think I'll just move at a faster speed or that I'll get something done zippity quick is when the bees remind me that it's always better for me to take my time and never, ever rush. The first time my soon-to-be wife experienced her first bee sting was when I said, I need to feed one of my hives some more syrup. I'll be quick. Let me just do it real fast. Then, because I was focused on working fast instead of watching what I was doing, I made a series of mistakes that led to my surprise that she still married me, soon to be wife, getting stung on her right thigh. Since I was going to be moving fast, I thought I'd skip lighting the smoker, which led to the alarm pheromones getting released and putting the bees on high alert. Next, I haphazardly laid the inner cover, which was covered in a fair number of bees against the side of the hive. And when I went to pour the syrup into the hive top feeder, I bumped into the inner cover, causing it to topple over and land on my never screamed, but couldn't believe what I had done, surprised that she still married me, soon to be wife's feet. Once the inner cover hit the ground, the bees became airborne, and the one that landed on my bride's thigh decided that she had had enough. Thankfully, once my so much smarter than me, never screamed, but couldn't believe what I had done, surprised that she still married me, soon to be wife realized that she had been stung, she immediately walked away from the hives, went back to the car, and waited until I was done. Now, whenever she accompanies me to the hives, the first thing she says is, did you light your smoker? And that's the thing about the book is that it focuses on people, the people who willingly choose to hang around with stinging insects, and it really delves into these cast of characters that, that I've met along the way, as well as highlighting a, a bunch of the silly to goofy mistakes that I've made as well. And uh, the, the chapter that sums that up really well is when I went to my first B meeting. <clears throat> Probably the most important listing in the state newsletter was information about the upcoming state beekeepers meeting. As soon as I saw it, I sent in my registration and a check for $25. The meeting was being held about two hours away, closer to Philadelphia than to New York. Even though the state of New Jersey may not be geographically the biggest state, it is quite diverse and it can be divided into four mindsets, New York suburbs, Philadelphia suburbs, farmland, and down the shore, which is anywhere on Jersey's 100 plus miles of beach. If you're not from Jersey, most of your information about it has probably come from one of the reality TV shows that was filmed within its borders which captured some local stereotypes, but is far from what it's really like to live here. What surprises most people about New Jersey is that it really is the garden state, as it has 9,000 farms covering 720,000 acres, and its biggest crops are blueberries, cranberries, and tomatoes. New Jersey has everything from a pygmy pine forest to the Appalachian Trail to the second largest waterfall east of the Mississippi River. And no matter where they live, most New Jerseyans love the natural setting their state has to offer. I arrived at the meeting bright and early, so I would be in line for the 7.30 a.m. check-in. The meeting was being held at Rutgers Eco Complex, which is on 
a Rutgers satellite campus in Bordertown, New Jersey, and it focuses on the environment and agriculture. Everyone that I met was super friendly and it was easy to see that most of these people had known one another for years. I didn't see anyone from our club, so I grabbed a coffee and a bagel and just walked around the atrium before heading into the meeting room. Within 30 minutes, the auditorium was full and every one of the 150 seats was taken. I was amazed to think that all these people had woken up at the crack of dawn on a Saturday morning just to listen to someone talk about bees. I had found my tribe. I looked around the room and thought of the children's book, Go Dog Go, only instead of big dogs, little dogs, red dogs, blue dogs, all at a dog party. This was tall beekeepers, short beekeepers, male beekeepers, female beekeepers, fat beekeepers, skinny beekeepers, old beekeepers, young beekeepers, all at the bee meeting. There were just as many women as men, just as many couples as singles. The more I scanned the room, the more I realized that there was not one type of person who kept bees. Beekeepers come in all sizes, shapes, genders, colors, and ages. The only thing anyone seemed to have in common was that they kept bees. And I will say another thing that's common about beekeepers is that, uh, that they really do seem to make good friends. You know, I, I've heard stories from non-beekeepers about how difficult it is to connect with adults um, that, that, you know, when they move to a new town or something. But with beekeepers, it's like this, uh, it, you know, fraternal order that exists internationally and that no matter where you go, that you always have this common thing to talk about. And beekeepers are always willing to talk about bees, nights, weekends, holidays, it doesn't matter. And um, I've met some of my best friends um, through beekeeping. And I think the reason that beekeepers are such good friends is because if you think about it, <clears throat> what beekeeping is, is that you're taking care of this big ball of insects that isn't gonna love you back. So that there's some sort of nurturing gene that's tied into wanting to do that. And, you know, if you think about it, like I said, that, you know, you have to have that nurturing gene if you want to care for thousands of bugs that are going to sting you. It's, and it's not like having a dog or a cat or another kind of pet that's going to show you emotion or love back. You know, if the bees, if you do something wrong, no matter how good you are to them, they'll sting you. Um, and this is uh, two of my favorite cartoons that, uh, you know, that are making fun of bees as a pet. You know, the one uh, on the left says, you know, that he likes to bring them inside when it's cold. And then the other one, when they're in bed says, oh, but it's okay for you to grade papers. And because beekeeping is um, such, a, such a nurturing thing is why it's great for the whole family or at least my whole family to do. These are my three kids um, and uh, they have all helped me with the bees. My, my daughters are now six and four, but when each of them were three, they uh, both held bees in their hand for the first time, which is what my uh, daughter Sophia is doing in the middle. And my son, is, as you read in the book, he, you know, I started around when he was in kindergarten. Um, so he's been helping me ever since. And I'd like to point out that um, <clears throat> my son is standing in front of a Maxent, instructor, uh, Maxent extractor. And that's where how you get honey out of the hive is to use one of those. And Maxent is actually made in Massachusetts. And those are the best extractors that uh, you can get. They're like the Rolls Royce of bee equipment. And um, I think the town was Devon, Massachusetts. So uh, maybe an hour or so away from you, but uh, um, they, they are the best and they're located in Massachusetts. But um, yeah, beekeeping is something that my whole family does together. It really is how we define ourselves and what keeps us close. Like I say, you know, a lot of families might wanna, um, play golf together or go out back and shoot hoops, but we do bee stuff. You know, we, we bottle our honey, we label it. We also make lip balm and it's just something that we do together. And that's why I'm proud to call myself bee people because of how much I love my bee people. So thank you very much. And now uh, we can go to questions. Thank you, Frank. And thanks everybody for uh, bearing with me, you know, technical difficulties, they happen. Um, so we have, uh, we've got one question I see coming in. Um, do beekeepers only keep honeybees that produce honey or are there other bee species that are kept? Question number one. So yeah, good question. So yeah, a beekeeper keeps um, 
Apis mellifera, which is the honeybee. So that that is when I when I talk about bees, that's the one I'm referring to. Now there are other types of bees that do pollinate, but they are, they aren't kept in the same way. Um, for instance, like bumblebees um, can pollinate inside a greenhouse, and so those are more commercially available. But I, I don't know of any hobbyist that keep bumblebees. And what's interesting is that while honeybees are, are in some ways very intelligent, like I talk about in my book, how uh, they're, they're the only invertebrate that can count to four. And they're one of the few animals of any species that understands the concept of zero. Honeybees, they can't navigate in a greenhouse because they just try to fly up to go out where the light is. But bumblebees are able to figure it out. So that's why inside greenhouses that they'll use bumblebees and not honeybees. Mm, interesting. All right. We've got another question coming in. Um, Where do you think would be the best place for a hive? So the, um, the rule of thumb is that look to where the snow melts first, because you want to have the sunniest location and you want to have it as dry as possible. So if you're going to put it in your yard, Keep that in mind. And then also it's best to face your hive south. So then that way bees are like people, they, they, they like to get out during the day. So by facing it south and the sun as it goes from east to west will cross over the entrance of the hive. And then also since the cold comes from the north, you'll have the back of the hive facing north uh, and it'll help protect the bees. Wonderful, great. Um, let's see, um, we've got another one. Um, why is it that um, you bottle honey in this shaped jar? Um, seems it would be much easier for the, um, for the user to have a squat wide mouth jar. So I guess you're referring to that jar. That's actually one of the most um, traditional honey jars. It's called a queen line. Um, I... I use this jar and I primarily use like a, a plastic version that has a dripless lid. And I prefer plastic, which I think is what you're getting at because it's easier because I can just squeeze it. Um, and then the dripless, it stops. So that, that to me is the most convenient uh, to have, but this is just a standard bottle. Um, let's see, what kinds of bees are best to keep? So, if you think of bees like dogs, so all, when I'm talking bees, I'm talking about Apis mellifera, the European honeybee, but think of those like dogs. And just like there's different breeds of dogs, there are different breeds of honeybees. So there's everything from Italian, which the big joke is that they have big families and they eat a lot, to Russian bees, which are better in the cold, which is, is not a joke and is true. And then there's things like, they're called carniolans, which we call carnies, you know, like circus carnies with small hands. And then um, there's some actual ones that came out of Purdue called Purdue ankle biters. And uh, there's the Buckfast, which came from the Buckfast Abbey in England. So you can, if you, so back to the analogy with dogs is that a lot of people will say this breed of dog is the best, you know? So if it's, if it's a German Shepherd or a Basset Hound, it depends on what kind of person you are and which of those you think is better. And so that's what I would say with bees is that it's really up to the individual. And the second thing I'll say is like, I prefer mutts. Like I'm just about the bees. To me, what's important is bees that overwinter well and make a lot of honey. So I just try to have the bees that make a lot of honey are the ones that I wanna make more bees from. And I don't really care what breeds they originally were. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right. Um, what happens to the bees during the winter? Excellent question. <clears throat> so the whole reason why honeybees make honey is so they have food to eat through the winter. And so what's interesting is that a worker bee life expectancy is only about six weeks. So the bees that are working right now, because right now is when everything's blooming. So we call it the nectar flow. So they'll work like in Jersey, they'll work from April through July, and then they have to make all their honey in that time period. So all the bees are making honey now, won't be around for when their sisters are finally hatched to eat that honey. So imagine spending your whole life 
just so some creature that you haven't met will have food to eat through the winter. It is amazing, right? And then what's interesting, so then you ask yourself, well, why do bees do that? Like a lot of other species of, of, of bees and insects and they'll, they'll more hibernate. So like back to the bumblebee, only the bumblebee queens will survive through the winter and then they have to start from scratch. So then they have to, the, the bumblebee has nothing other than herself, but a honeybee colony, because there'll be tens of thousands of them um, coming out of winter, that the queen will ramp up her egg laying production and a queen bee can lay up to 2000 to 2000 eggs. And so she'll ramp up to that so that she has a full workforce in place before or as everything starts to bloom. So what's, if you think about like dandelions are usually the first out flower and that's why bees go to them and why they're so important. So about 45 days before a dandelions would bloom is when the queen starts ramping up her egg laying. So she has two generations of bees that takes worker bees uh, 21 days to hatch. So she'll have all those bees ready to go collect pollen and nectar the moment that they bloom. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna skip around in questions um, because we're having, we have a lot of questions coming in, <laughs> which is fabulous. So thank you everybody, um, just to kind of, tag on to, to the last question. Since they need the honey to survive the winter, how do you know how much honey you can take from the hive to eat yourself? So if you think of a hive like a filing cabinet, the bottom drawer is their nursery. So that's where the, the queen will lay her eggs. The next drawer up is their pantry and that's where they have honey for themselves. And uh, in the Northeast that they need approximately 80 pounds of honey. And we know that so in each of those drawers or boxes, there's 10 file folders in there that we call frames. And each frame will weigh, when it's filled with honey, approximately 10 pounds. So we know if that box has eight or more frames filled, it has enough honey for themselves. But then what I do, all, all beekeepers do, is we keep putting boxes on top. So the, the bees have their own two boxes and then honey for the beekeeper goes above that. And uh, like for my, and this is just because I'm weird, but uh, that my, my, the, I paint the hives that the parts that my bees are going to be in lots of bright and wacky colors, but then the honey that I take off, I paint those boxes all white. So visually you can see too, which boxes are mine and which boxes are theirs. Okay. Wonderful. Um, skip, continuing to skip around. Um, Let's see, um, what makes the different flavors of honey? So honey is 100% dependent upon what flowers the bees go to. And what's, what's interesting is that, um, so bees are um, monofluoritic, that they, they, they stick to one flower when it's in bloom. So like if you see like clover or um, buckwheat or cranberry honey, that's because the bees have worked that flower then the beekeepers pulled off those boxes I was just talking about when the, the cranberries are out of bloom. And what's interesting from an evolutionary standpoint with that is, is how bees and flowers evolve together. So it makes, if you're a flower, you want bees to only be pollinating one type of flower because if you're a cranberry flower, avocado pollen doesn't help you reproduce. You need the, so that that's why bees will do that. But um, so, and what's interesting too, is like, it, you know, even though I'm like, I'm talking about cranberry honey, it doesn't taste like the red tart fruit. It has its own unique flavor, but it, it, but it doesn't taste like the fruit that the plant produces. And you can get some wacky plants that produce some excellent honey in that respect. Um, like butter bean is one. So you think of like the brown lima beans, but that plant produces its own honey. And then the other thing too, is that the, when you see a lighter honey, then that tends to be uh, flowers that have bloomed earlier in the season. So kind of like maple syrup that you have maple syrup that is harvested in the spring is light, the fall is dark. The same is true with honey. Wonderful. So I guess sort of tied, tied to this, um, the question coming in from a patron was, do you grow the plants that bees like? To kind of tack on to that, I, I would ask a broader question of if there are people in the audience who um, 
love bees, but don't necessarily want to keep bees, what are some other ways that you can support bees, um, you know, such as with planting different, different good plants for them? So um, just some of my, my favorite bee facts, which tie into that, it takes 12 bees to make a teaspoon of tea, a uh, teaspoon of honey. <laughs> so it takes 12 bees lifetime work to make one teaspoon of honey. So that means that it takes almost 1200 bees to make a pound of honey. And to make that pound of honey, and this gets to the question that the bees have to visit approximately 2 million flowers. And then to visit those 2 million flowers requires a combined flight um, of 56,000 miles, which is twice around the equator of the earth. And that's for one pound. And like I said, the bees for themselves need 80 pounds to survive the winter before a beekeeper starts taking the honey off. So when you realize how many millions of flowers it would take to um, make a pound of honey that I don't really plant anything because I just, you know, unless you have acres and acres of farmland, you're not going to be able to have enough um, flowers that would actually make a difference. And what's interesting in suburbia where most of the bees are going to get that kind of quantity. And I'll bet you like, if you looked out your window right now, you would see what I'm about to say because they're the most plentiful trees. Mm -hmm. So trees up in the canopy have little flowers and I'll, I'll, I'll air quote flowers um, that produce the nectar that the bees go to. So like linden trees and black locust are two that are very popular um, and, and that make good honey that the bees go to because they bloom early in the spring. So now to your question, Lizzie, what can us non beekeepers do for bees? So the first thing I always say is leave a few dandelions in your yard. Nobody wants a whole sea of them, but because they're one of the first things to bloom, just leave a couple. Then you're giving the bees an opportunity to collect some pollen and nectar before everything else gets started. The second thing is to, is to plant um, some native uh, perennials that are attract all pollinators. And when you plant them, plant them in like bunches, uh, you know, like, like a three feet across bunch, because that makes the bees easier to see it and see that there's more than one and they're more likely to, to go to it. The third and probably the easiest thing is use less chemicals on your lawn, less pesticides, herbicides, you know, fertilizer, that if you cut back on that, then that's going to benefit your yard and make it easier for bees to, to feed off of maybe some of the things that you may not like, but the bees, bees would be able to get food from. Wonderful. Great advice. Um, we've got another question. Um, again, thanks everybody for these great questions and thanks Frank for the interesting answers. Um, let's see, we have this question. Um, totally new. Oh, very nice bee pun. Totally new bee to all things beekeeping and still in research stages of how to jump in. Do you have a go-to beekeeper book that you like to recommend? Sure. So my, my number one piece of advice is join your local beekeeping club. Massachusetts has some fantastic beekeeping clubs. So that will help you more than anything else. Um, <laughs> even I'm an, even I'm an author, I'm saying join the club before buying the book. Then uh, on top of that, if you are looking for a how-to book and you're only going to buy one, then get the Beekeeper Handbook by Diane Sematatro, I think is how you say it. And it just came out in a fifth edition, um, but that's the single best how-to book you can get. But as a newbie, if you're a, a book nerd like I am, then uh, the best how-to beginning beekeeping books, one is by Kim Flottam which is the backyard beekeeper. And the other is actually beekeeping for dummies. I, I know for sure that we have both of those last two books in the library because I have them checked out right now. <laughs> so we do have them in the collection. Um, so if, for anybody who is interested, um, you, you can place holds on those books and, and get them quickly because I'll return them. And while um, my book is not a, a how-to book that I do weave a lot of uh, useful information in there. And I, because I tell you the mistakes that I made that, that you can hopefully learn from my mistakes so you don't have to make them as well. All right. Let's see. Um, are there bees that don't sting? 
There is a type of bee, a stingless bee, um, that exists in Australia, in some parts of South America, and possibly Asia. And they don't make as much honey, um, but they do make some honey. So I, I have seen programs on that. And it's interesting that they make like little wax pots in their hive that, um, that they store the honey in. So it's not, it's like, imagine instead of the comb that we're, we're used to, if it literally looked almost like a teacup made out of wax that they fill up. Interesting. Um, let's see, um, kind of on, on that same similar topic. Um, can you develop allergies, anaphylaxis to bees when you get stung? Yeah, it's, it, it goes, it goes both ways is that, um, that, so first of all, if you have a reaction at the sting site, that's natural. So like if your hands even like, let's say it gets stung on the hand, but it blows up like a lobster claw, then because it was at the sting site, that's still a natural reaction. The issue is that if the reaction travels more than two joints, so meaning like if you got stung on your finger, then all of a sudden up around past your shoulder that you're getting itchy, then that means it's a systemic reaction. So you have some people that when they start, they may get that. And then you get other people. Um, and most people, I would say that while you would swell up with a lobster claw at first, your body actually builds up a resistance to it. And you don't have anywhere near the reaction that you once did. And also as a point of comparison, that if you look at the percentages of people that are allergic to bee stings versus peanuts, you're 500 times more likely to be allergic to peanuts than you are to honeybee venom. Interesting. Let's see, um, another, another hot bee topic, um, colony collapse. Um, let's see, uh, we've got a couple, of, a couple of related questions on that. Um, can you explain um, colony collapse and possibly the reasons behind it? Sure, so colony collapse disorder was, um, like a perfect storm of events that happened several years ago, more than several. But um, the way to describe it is like, imagine if you went into a big apartment building in Boston and every apartment building, every, every, every apartment in the, in the building had plenty of food and babies, but there were no adults. And that's what it was like. It was unusual for a hive to have brood is what we call babies and food there, but no, no worker bees. So that's why it was such a unique instance. Um, so it was, it was kind of like it happened over a few year period and then went away and they haven't seen it in a while. However, that one of the contributing factors and one of the things that still is happening to bees is there's a parasitic mite called Varroa destructor. And in, in the book, there's a full chapter on these because they are they are the primary cause of colony collapse disorder, and they are the primary reason why bees around the world are dying. And the, um, the mite is not is a non-native uh, parasite, and it came to the U.S. in 1987. And um, there's only two places in the world where there's bees that there are not mites. That's Australia and Newfoundland. Every place else that these mites have have migrated to. And in addition to where, what they do is when a, a baby bee, a brood is, a larvae is developing, that the, the mite will sneak in and suck out the nutrients. So you think like prenatal nutrition and imagine if there was a parasite sucking the nutrients off of that developing baby and that's what the mite's doing. Second, and what's even more dangerous, and, and as we're living through a pandemic, really think about this, the mites are a vector for bee viruses. So they're only things that affect bees, they don't affect people, but the mites are carrying more and more of these viruses. So they're more deadly and it takes fewer mites to kill off honeybee colonies. And that's why the big joke at beekeeping meetings is that beekeepers talk more about mites than we do about honeybees. Um, okay, then we've got, let's see. Um, can you speak about beekeepers who bring hives to farmland and manage them? We have at least one apiary like that in the area. Yeah, so that's, um, <clears throat> they're doing that for pollination. And what's, what's wild, so like um, that 
the the largest pollination event in the world is the almond pollination, which takes place in Northern California. And 80% of the world's almonds come from this area in California that's about the size of Rhode Island. And um, the, the almond trees are 100% dependent on honeybees to be pollinated to make the nut. And um, two out of every three beehives in the US go there every February to pollinate. And that's, that's how big the commercial beekeepers are. And so um, the New York Times had said that the almond crop is a $7.6 billion industry to give you an idea of the scale. And that's uh, out of the over 20 billion crops that worth of crops that are pollinated every year by honeybees in the US. So what you're experiencing there is that that beekeeper is, is, is bringing the bees in for a short period of time. Maybe it's an apple orchard, maybe it's cranberry bog, I don't know. But what they'll do is they'll hire beekeepers to have the bees sit there. So then that way they'll work those crops and, and why it works is if I, like I said earlier, that bees like to stay on one flower as long as it's in bloom. And because bees are also, um, they, they will maximize their efforts. So if there's a whole um, farm of a particular plant, the bees are gonna work it because there's more of that plant available to them than uh, other things. And it's interesting that there was um, Tom Seeley, who's like the, biggest bee guru researcher out of Cornell um, has done a lot of research on this, but he did this one thing to see how bees will divide a colony and to resources. Like you figure there's a finite number of bees and then there's all these different things blooming. How does a colony decide how many bees to send where, right? And so by studying that, he worked with um, a computer scientist and together they developed an algorithm and that algorithm is now used for web servers to move web traffic around the internet. <laughs> Interesting. Hmm. All right. Um, we've got a couple of questions um, about honey. So there's some, in, I'm sort of combining a couple questions. So um, what are the medicinal uses for honey? And can you talk about raw honey specifically too? Sure. So here's, here's the funny thing that there is no scientific proof that honey helps for allergies. So a lot of people will consume local honey because they've heard it helps with allergies and it may, but there's no scientific proof of that. So I just want to be clear, <laughs> clear about that. Um, but honey does have medicinal properties that has been proven. Um, it has been shown to be equally, if not more effective than over-the-counter cough syrups. And also that um, in some uh, w open wounds that people will get, that they will use honey as opposed to any other kind of antibiotic or anything else because they found it's more effective. And when you think about our modern medicine and how crazy wild it is and, and, and advanced it is, that there's a product called um, medical or medical honey which is pre put on bandages that the hospitals today will still use uh, to care for people, which blows me away to think about, a, you know, they've been, there were cave paintings over 35,000 years old where they, of people collecting honey out of, out, out of wild hives, you know, and the ancient Egyptians also kept bees in logs as um, the, the, the hives. And if you think of, we've been keeping bees that long and, and, and honey's been used for medicinal things and to, that it still works better than some of our medicines is phenomenal. So why is that? So the reason is, is that when nectar comes in, it's sucrose. And then what the bees do is they add an enzyme to that sucrose and they break it down into fructose and glucose. And by breaking it down into simple sugars, then that means that the, 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 sugar, the sugars in the honey can get absorbed by our cells faster and more efficiently. If you've ever had Gatorade, Gatorade is glucose. That's why it's a big deal. Um, so when the bees are doing that, one of the byproducts of making the glucose is actually a naturally occurring hydrogen peroxide in the honey. Um, and so that plus its pH factor and because when the nectar comes in, it can be over 80% water and bees have to bring it down to less than 19% uh, 
water for it to be honey. So think like maple syrup again, start, you know, five gallon bucket of sap goes down to less than a quart of finished syrup. Same kind of thing with the honey. So because it has so little moisture and it has a, a pH and it also, um, because of the hydrogen peroxide is why honey has medicinal purposes. Interesting stuff. Okay, let's let we're, we're still just kind of floating around <laughs> here. How many hives do you have? And um, what type so I guess that's already been answered. People are curious about what type of honeybees you have, but you have lots of different kinds, it sounds like, or a mix. Yes, yeah, so I, have, I have 15 hives right now. Um, I have three different locations that I keep them in. And 15 is fine for me. Like I, I call myself a sideliner. I don't want to have more. Um, it's something I do primarily for fun. Um, and because I'm addicted to doing stuff with honeybees, but, uh, that that's, that's where I am. And if it, the question is what kind of hives I have is I keep uh, a Langstroth, which is the most traditional of hives, which the Langstroth hive was invented in 1851 in downtown Philadelphia. And what um, the Reverend Langstroth discovered is that if you maintain bee space, which is three eighths of an inch, that the bees won't connect it with comb. They use that as like hallways. And because of that, we can pull out the frames or the file folders and inspect the bees or also harvest the honey without hurting the, the colony of bees. And um, that one discovery <clears throat> is now the basis for all types of hives around the world. Have you, have you experimented with different kinds of hives, like the top bar hive, or have you kept it pretty, pretty I, traditional? I have, I have not personally had a top bar or a warre hive, but I have been around people that have them and then have inspected those hives with those people. And um, for a lot of reasons, I think that the standard Langstroth is the best way to go. This is kind of going back to the winter, um, but I guess I think that this is really more a predator question. So how do you protect your hive in the winter? But I think really just how do you protect your hive generally from bears, um, from, you know, skunks, raccoons, whoever else is interested in the honey? Yeah. So if, if you have bears in your area, then you do need to get an electric fence and the bee supply companies all sell um, solar powered or battery powered electric fences that you can use. And what they tell you to do is to bait the fence with like bacon or peanut butter, because you want that bear to get zapped because once it gets zapped, it won't come back. Um, but if the bear, once a bear finds your hives, if you don't have a fence like that, it's going to tear them up. And it's like, and the bear's not going to stop until it, it's eaten everything and bears I always say that Winnie the Pooh lied to you that the bears aren't primarily interested in the honey. They're, they're primarily trying to eat the bee larvae and the bees for the protein. So they'll eat, they'll eat the honey second, but it's, it's the protein that they're after. So um, that's bees, but you mentioned skunks, which is a big problem with hives. And that's why it's, you want to put your hives uh, like one to two cinder blocks up because what, what skunks do is they scratch at the front of the hive and as bees come out, the skunks will eat them. But if you put your hives up high enough, then that exposes the skunk's belly and then the bees can, can sting them, the skunk there. Okay. Um, so in the see. winter, I guess the only thing, the other thing in the winter is that it's, that it's temperature doesn't infect bees because bees are native to Sweden to, uh, Finland and Russia. So if they can survive those winters, they can survive a Northeast winter, but it's just important to make sure that they have enough food and also that it's not the temperature, but moisture can kill them. So you have to make sure that your hives are ventilated during the winter. Um, how does a bee become a queen and why does she look different? <laughs> so <clears throat> it's, um, what's interesting is that, so first of all, when a queen bee lays an egg, she's, she's determining if it's gonna be a female or a male because the males are the drones and those are not fertilized. Those, so those are what we call hapatoids. It only has half, hap is half of the, uh, of the DNA. So it's a full replica genetically of the queen. And so if a queen lays a fertilized egg, then it's either gonna become a worker bee 
or a queen bee. And what the worker bees are the ones that decide if it's gonna be a queen bee or not. And if it is, then they feed that, after the egg hatches, it's a larvae, and they'll start feeding that larvae different food. If you've ever heard of royal jelly, that that's, um, royal jelly is a special, it's a bee milk that's secreted from a gland in the bee's head, and they feed that exclusively to that larvae. And then instead of being a flat honeycomb, that they actually build the wax out so it looks like a peanut in the shell. So think of what a peanut in the shell looks like. Imagine if that's made out of wax. And then because that, that egg had different food and more space to grow, it'll develop into a queen bee. And what's interesting is how different, it's almost like a different insect because a worker bee will la live for six weeks. A queen bee can live two to four years. A worker bee has a barbed stinger. A queen bee has a straight stinger. And she has that because she never uses it to defend the hive like the worker bee does. The queen bee also has a full, fully functional reproductive system. The worker bee does not. And so it goes back and forth of all these differences just because of different food and more space to grow. Isn't that wild? That is wild. That is very interesting. Um, one of my favorite things about your book was the, the description of the, the queen battles. I wonder if you wouldn't mind telling everybody about that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, so I always say that bees would be great in Vegas because they're always playing the odds. And so when they'll build a queen, and so why do they build a queen? They build a new queen for one of two reasons. One, that um, when the queen bee starts to, to decline, she's no longer able to lay enough eggs. And that's how the workers know that she's starting to fail. So they'll, they'll create what we call supersedure cells, which are those peanuts that are specific to replace their own queen. The second time that bees will do it is that they wanna swarm. And right now it's swarm season. So you may see stuff in the news and that's when a big ball of bees will hang from a tree or some other place. And the reason that bees swarm is if you think back to high school biology and you know single cell organisms, they reproduce by splitting in two. And that's what a honeybee colony is doing is they'll create new queens and then the old queen and half the bees leave so then they can spread their genetics you know, and, and now they have two locations. So what, when bees are gonna do one of those two things, they don't just make one peanut because what if that gets damaged? So they'll make multiples of them. And then the first queen that comes out, what she uses her straight stinger for is to go and whack all her, um, the other queen cells that haven't hatched yet. But sometimes two queens will come out together. And if they do, then they first, what they do is they do this thing called piping, which is they make this noise that you can hear. And, it, it, um, and what it is, is that they're, they're calling to each other so they know each other's location and they're basically smack talking so they can come together to battle to the death. And it's like, what's interesting with the, um, the piping, it's like, it, it sounds sort of like this. It goes beep, 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 beep. And so you'll hear two of these different, those sounds going. And then, yeah, when they get together, it's, it's like a cage match, you know, two go in, one, only one comes out. And the reason for that is that I always say is that think of the queen like the heart of the organism. So imagine if our body was able to make new hearts when ours started to fail, but the way our bodies worked is it would make several. Well, we would want the strongest heart to take over right away and get rid of the weaker hearts so that that way we could get back to life. And that, that's, that's essentially what the bee colony is doing. Fascinating stuff. All right. We are, we've almost hit eight o'clock. So I think we've got time for another couple questions. Um, so let's see, we've got another one. Um, what is the farthest away from a hive um, that, that bees fly? So on average that um, the worker bees will travel three miles and they've been found as far as seven miles, but the three is really what I say is the average. Now here's the interesting thing though, is that the queen bee, after she hatches out and either does the battle royal or not, she has to go on her mating flight. And so the queen bees 
when they go on these mating flights, because bees mate up in the air and, and they're like the size of like a soccer field that are 30 to 50 feet in the air. And they're like, um, they're like bee singles bars. So all the male bees, the drones, that's their only job is to mate with a queen. So they're flying back and forth, waiting for a virgin queen to come. And then um, the when a, a, a queen comes up, then she'll mate with up to 24 drones during that flight. And then she'll have enough reproductive material to last her lifetime. And drones, after they, they mate, they die. So what's interesting is that when queens go on this mating flight, they will fly over nine miles away. And the reason is, is that the drones will go to the nearer, the closer um, drone congregation areas. And then the queens go further. And that's because that would be sisters and brothers. So basically the brothers stay close to the, the single bars that are close to home. The, the sister queen goes further away so that she can mate with uh, drones with other genetics. Interesting. Okay, so we have, we have so many questions coming in. Thank you, everybody. We're not gonna quite have time for all of them. So um, let's see. Um, um, let's go back here. Okay, do you require any license to keep bees? That, that depends on where you live. Like in the state of New Jersey, for instance, that the, there's a state laws that govern beekeeping. But in Massachusetts, it might be more by your municipality. Okay, great. Um, and let's do last question, I think. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, so many good questions, everybody. Thank you, guys. Um, yes, we'll just do the very last one. Um, what's so special about Manuka honey from New Zealand and why is it so beneficial for your health? How about we make this not the last question? I'll answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so, because because here's the thing, is that I believe, as, as do all beekeepers, that you're better off going to your local beekeeper, find the guy that's down the street or a, a couple blocks away and buy his honey. Um, because then you're going to, su by supporting your local beekeeper, then they'll be able to keep pollinating the plants in your yard and the neighboring yards to, to make where you live look better. So with all that said, that Manuka honey comes from Manuka plant in uh, New Zealand. And it has, so as I was saying that honey has all these antiviral and antimicrobial things naturally, that the Manuka has one extra ingredient. And I always forget the name of the, the substance, but it's abbreviated MGO. And that's why you see the, the level of MGO on the Manuka honey. So what you're doing is you're getting this extra boost of the antiviral from that plant. But that's in theory because honey is also the second most counterfeited food in the world. Olive oil is the first. And then so for me, when I see that Manuka honey, how much it is, you know, but it's being shipped from around the world, you know, I, 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 I personally would rather go to New Zealand to try it, what it really tastes like, or two, just like I said, buy honey from the guy down the street where his, you're still going to get the medic, you know, medicinal properties of any kind of honey. Okay, well then we, let's do one more question then if Manuka's not the last. Um, so uh, um, how do apiaries breed queens? This will this will be our, our final one. So the um, so like I said, how bees will play the odds and that they'll make multiple of these cells. So there are specific queen breeders, and then they work off that system. And they they um, so what's interesting is that that it starts as a queen cup. So imagine a cough a, a teacup upside down. And that's what the bees will make out of wax. And then the queen will lay the egg upside down in that, that, that cup. And so what queen breeders do is they, they artificially have those. So they have a whole file folder of a bunch of those. So the, the queens, oh, this must be a queen cells that we want to build. So then the queen will go and, and lay eggs in that. Um, so that, that's the, the breeder way. Then there's other things that um, people like I do where when they go into a hive, if they see queen cells that, um, because a hive wants to swarm, for instance, 
that you take that frame out that has those cells on it and you just move it with some other bees to another location. And then that'll, that queen, when she hatches out, she will return to the new location and um, you'll have a mini hive with that new queen, which then you can transfer into, into a new box. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of different ways. And that's the thing that I love about beekeeping. There's this whole practical side to it that we've been talking about, but there's also this nerd side and I'm a self-described bee nerd. And in my book, I have these bee nerd alerts that goes deeper into a lot of the content, but there's this whole other intellectual side to beekeeping that's really satisfying as well, because it is, bees are one of the most uh, researched creatures on the planet. So there's always new stuff to learn about them. That, that's a fabulous way to, to end our talk tonight, I think, Frank. So thank you so much for, for sharing all of your expertise with, with our patrons and patrons from um, all of the communities around. Um, thank you, Robert and Tewksbury, for, for letting us use your Zoom account for this so we could invite more people in. Um, just a big thank you to everybody. Um, so, uh, so I think that, that that's pretty much it. I will say one more time that um, I did put the link for Haley Booksellers um, into the chat. It is also in the event descriptions um, for all of our respective libraries. So if you would like to support a local bookstore and um, buy Frank's book from Haley Booksellers, um, you could try both of those places. Um, you can also check out um, more about Frank at um, frankthebeeman.com. <laughs> and, uh, and yes, any, any last words, Frank, before we wrap it up tonight? Well, I just want to thank everybody that I've been doing different talks uh, the last couple of months, but this was great. There were so many fantastic questions and just shows you again that uh, being in the Northeast is the best place to be. So thank you, Massachusetts. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great night, all. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, have a lovely evening. Bye.